Have you wanted to use your home equity to pay off debt or improve your house, but found the old way too painful? There's now a new, better option for accessing your home equity. It's called HomePace. Here's the key. It's not a loan, so there's no monthly payments or interest. Instead, HomePace gives you money up front as an investment in your home. That's right. You get money that you can use however you want without the burden of monthly payments. Then someday when you decide to sell, you share a portion of the gains or losses in your home's value with HomePace. That means if your home's value drops, HomePace takes a loss too. HomePace gives homeowners a better choice to access home equity. No monthly payments, no interest. To get an instant quote, go to HomePace.com quote. It takes less than five minutes. That's HomePace slash quote to get started. Welcome to the Psychobetical Podcast. I'm Andy Kirkpatrick, and this week I thought I would cover the topic of Doug Scott. Uh, now, Doug Scott died early this year of, uh, of brain cancer, I think. And uh, I would, at the time, wasn't really doing any podcasts, so I would, I would have done it then. But it's been on my mind that I should really sort of share a few stories uh, about Doug Scott, really, because he was. A really like remarkable person. I don't think we'll see see his like again. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, my own did I? I, I guess I knew uh, Doug Scott existed as a like a as a young climber. Like I'd um, like I knew about the the auger and uh, and the southwest face of Everest, the Nanapena and things. Like I don't think I would have. I don't think I would have read any books about them, but they must have been must have been like conscious of them and i think it was conscious from looking from reading sort of old magazines um like high, like high magazine mountain magazine like old issues of mountain magazine uh that you know who doug scott was and and um so as slowly as my sort of understanding of uh climbing grew like then my kind of respect for for doug kind of in um sort of it sort of increased but the the first time I ever actually met met Doug Scott was I went to I was working in London um, in an outdoor shop and back 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 in the day they used to have this thing called Cola which was a um, what did it stand for Camping Outdoor Leisure Association or something and it was a big kind of event in Harrogate uh, where where all the uh, outdoor brands would sort of get together for like. Was it a week or a weekend or something? Was it? I think it was a weekend. Anyway, but they would they would all like uh, rock up there and they would like you know like take over the uh, convention center and there'd be all this stuff. It was like Harrogate. I don't know if it's still the same, but it used to be, you know that that was every week there'd be a new kind of convention going on in Harrogate. Apparently, the worst, the most badly behaved convention ears were the toy people. Apparently, so. Anyway, so for some reason, I'm at the the company I work for, they would they'd send like a few people up to Harrogate so they could walk around and see what was coming out and what was new. I'm sure the I was only like a spotty like you know a new person working in the shop, which was soon to go bankrupt anyway. So um maybe like it's so, some businesses they would send people there so they could look around and come back and report on like new gear. So if you had someone working for you who was like really uh really nerdy then it's like an ideal place to go and also if you wanted to move out of like retailing uh, being a retailer like a salesperson and become a rep or work for an outdoor company that was a place to go really you could go around and sort of impress people how what, what a nerd you were or how much you could drink or something so yes yeah, so i went up on the train i think i went I probably went up by myself i went up on the train from london and uh, arrived in Harrogate. Uh, Harrogate's kind of quite nice, really. It's a bit like it's a bit like uh, York, very very kind of fancy. So anyway, so I went went around the uh, went around the the trade show, and it was like it was a really it was a really interesting time back then. There was a lot more manufacturers, manu- UK manufacturers manufacturing in the UK. So you still had Carrymore, uh, Berghaus, Phoenix. 
uh, just you said like a lot of uh, companies that don't really exist anymore in that in that you know they either don't exist at all or they they don't make anything in this country anymore. But there was a lot of energy. I, I expect it's still the same. But in those in that time, you just had a lot of very old school kind of experienced people who made shit and all of them were like really really into whatever they did so climbing skiing mountaineering all that kind of stuff so you'd have you know you'd ha- you'd have like you know rab carrington there you know doing selling his sleeping bags and you'd have pete hutchinson doing his stuff with mountain equipment and uh, just all the all these all these people um so it was it was like it was really it was really interesting you could see why the uk had this such a vibrant kind of outdoor you know sort of brand like it was probably push punching above its weight in terms of um innovation and, and everything else so anyway so but at the time i was like i'd become really obsessed with uh buffalo uh which was uh which is made in sheffield um it's still made in sheffield and the uh, the guy who'd started buffalo was a guy called hamish hamilton and hamish uh he had been uh It'd be great to interview him sometime because he was is a very interesting guy. But he, I think he was in the RAF and he was like a radar operator or something. And then he left and then he start, was started designing stuff and he designed the Force Ten tent, the cotton tent, and he and he made the tent orange because it was more romantic on the inside. Like if anybody's ever, like I'm sure some people here will have slept in a Force Ten tent, and it was just basically orange. Was it the inside was orange, like the the uh, the inner tent and the fly sheet? They're all made out of orange cotton, and they were actually really really good tents. Like the they kept the rain out and they were bloody you know tough, but they didn't have as much, didn't have a lot of room in, and they're also quite heavy. Like the ground sheet was literally like rubber, like a rubber thing. But there is still, I expect people still use them, like you know expedition sort of tents and things, because they were just kind of indestructible. They just lasted forever, and. And then he went on and he designed other things. Um, and he basically was one of the people... He basically invented Pertex. I, d- I don't know the exactly how it happened, but basically he wanted a fabric which would uh, act like a blotting paper so when water hit it, it would, uh, through capillary action, it would spread out right across the, the entire surface of the fabric. And then it would be able to like be evaporated much easier through body heat or through through wind or convection and all that kind of and all that kind of malarkey and so he actually went to uh pervert is it per, 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 anyway these people have made um printer ribbons that was what their uh you know that's how, that's how they made all the money they made printer ribbons and he, and he i think he sort of managed to source that printer ribbon uh material which i guess would it be nylon um but in much wider you know like meter multi-meter widths and that so began Pertex, and I think he was one of the first. He was the first person to use Pertex, uh, which he kind of combined with fiber pile. Um, so you had this like wicking layer, which would suck the moisture would be, would go through the uh, the fiber pile uh, into the Pertex, and it would be evaporated over the surface, and it would dry super quick. And because fiber pile goes down to little tiny points, uh, the actual points would be dry because you're your body you know the, the amount of contact out of 100 percent of fabric on your touch on your body maybe only like 10 percent of it was actually touching your body because it was going down to these fine fiber pile points so the um you people would feel completely dry in a buffalo shirt and in like torrential rain and then you'd like squeeze their arm and then all the water would you know like rush through their clothes and stuff so it was the water was in there but it was just kind of uh your, your body heat was like keeping it a bit Anyway, so so for some reason I got uh, I got really obsessed with uh, with buffalo. I, I managed to I had a buffalo some buffalo clothing which I'd got when I lived in Hull when I was just getting into sort of doing outdoorsy stuff, and I got some some on sale or something. And my dad had given me some, and some some sort of ex, some stuff he had. And then um, so I, yeah, I was always always like badgering. I'd always be ringing up Hamish Hamilton and telling him how good it was and all this kind of. I was just, I was a bit of an I was probably a bit of a stalker, like an outdoor gear stalker type person. Anyway, so I uh, I ended up coming up to coming up to Cola, and then I was like hanging around. Uh, I was looking at everything, and then but hanging around with Hamish, and and I think I'd I don't, that's maybe that was the first time I'd met Hamish. But he was uh, he was he, he looked very much like kind of like Rolf Harris kind of looking, 
uh, character. He always wore his buffalo shirt, no matter what when it when it was summer, winter, whatever. So uh, he was kind of bespeckled, kind of um, cross between Fagin and um, <laughs> cross between Fagin and um, Rolf Harris. So then, then were the days when you when Rolf Harris could be mentioned, and uh, he eventually eventually he got like some kind of a ME or something from working too hard so he just he kind of i think somebody else must have run the company i'm not sure what happened but he kind of left the left the scene which is a shame because he was a really <coughs> he's a really innovative 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 he was he was a clever guy and he um he was really really uh um stuck to his guns like it was he's a very good person to study really because he was not in he was only interested in absolute performance like he didn't think you should put like flaps over the zips because they didn't need it and he didn't think you should you know if you look at a buffalo shirt it looks like very very simple but it's actually like a lot of things it's actually very very um complex like the ideas behind it like it's designed to be simple because you don't want loads of excess seams because where you have a seam you have multi layers of fabric and the fabric is going to dry much slowly much more slowly and hold the moisture and everything else so very actually a buffalo shirt Although it's maybe like thirty years old now, it's still like one of the best bits of clothing I think you know that's ever been invented for the outdoors. So um, anyway, so if, uh, towards the end of the show, like I was gonna, I guess I was gonna go back back to London on the last train, and Hamish was like, "Oh, do you want to come for a meal? And you can stay in the um, you can stay in the in the hotel." Um, these days, you never do that because you know you never know what might happen. You might get wake up give you some dodgy tagine and you'd wake up you know getting raped or something so anyway but um uh <laughs> in those days you know you were young and naive so you went along i did get raped no so i uh, so i i um i said oh that's great yeah so so i went along to this uh this this hotel where they were staying at and there was all these like people who i can i can't there were lots of people who you'd invite to this meal who were obviously in the trade and uh uh and but there was like doug scott i was like it was like oh my god that's like that's like doug scott like oh my god he's and he was and doug like really like i once i once actually saw i was once in plassey brennan in the climbing wall and doug scott came in and he sort of took off his top so he didn't i didn't have a top on and he just looked like he looked like arnold schwarzenegger he was like he was like so strong he was just this like huge brick of a brick of a man really and he did, apparently he played a lot of rugby when he was early on in his life he was just like really really strong kind of guy just like nat, must be just naturally strong and he uh and he sort of exudes that kind of strength like when he's in a room and everyone's kind of drawn to him and i remember he was telling sort of all these like stories he's like don willen he'd always have these like don willen kind of impersonations and uh he had it's very hard to do it he had some story about don willen saying about taking his wife to the himalayas um anyway it's, 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 you have to do you have to do the hand things about so anyway so it doesn't matter so he um so anyway so we had, then then we all went went through to have the have our meals everyone was sitting on tables and probably at probably on purpose i ended up sitting on doug scott's table and i remember there was doug scott there was this guy guy called paul this guy called nick and this guy called tony this old guy and it turned out that the guy called paul was paul braithwaite who was the guy who like paul braithwaite don't know a lot about him but he was the guy who kind of forged through the rock band on the southwest face of everest so he was you know phenomenally strong um strong climber very sort of skinny skinny guy uh you know you wouldn't the thing if you ever look at doug scott's um doug scott's sort of photo book that ken wilson brought out there's a picture of there's a really great picture of like paul braithwaite looking up on mount kenya like looking up all wet and bedraggled and so and nick kikas was the other guy and nick was a like a himalayan sort of mountain guide who eventually kind of got i don't know what happened to him but he got sort of embroiled in um some horrible legal stuff about the british guy dying on everest so i don't know if he's still guides and stuff and then tony was this guy tony greenbank who was who's dead now who's a famous he's a sort of really well-known character in like late district climbing like like writer raconteur and stuff so so yeah so it was like it was like amazing like just being on this table i don't remember anything that 
anyone was telling saying anything but it just it just was it was mark it was just interesting how that i felt kind of comfortable with uh you know these like sort of like well you know um doug was definitely like a hero and um and paul kind of became like one of my heroes like later on the more i knew about what he'd done and um he's got some he had some amazing stories i think i think paul braithwaite did like the first maybe did the first british ascent of the bernati pillar or something and he had this story that they just slept on the slept on montembers on like a bench and then when they then they walked across the glacier and went up to the bottom of the route and then they realized they'd left all their pitons behind or something they had to do it without any pitons and but they did it anyway but yeah really uh, interesting uh interesting character so um so yeah that was that was that my first time of meeting doug scott so i i don't have any amazing um recollections really but apart from apart from he was uh you know he's just he kind of lived up he wasn't like disappointing really he was kind of funny and interesting and uh, always had lots of the interesting things to say and then a funny story. Then later on, I worked for, I worked for Dick Turnbull outside, and uh, Dick had this funny story about Doug Scott, and that he was invited to some bag house uh, like brainstorming event up in the winter time, and there was Doug Scott and Chris Bonington, and uh, I think Andy Cave was there, and all these quite a few like well known climbers. And the idea was they would go out climbing in the daytime. And then they would uh, meet up in the evening and talk about uh, gear, gear ideas and things. Uh, and it, it, in the, at that time, Berghaus were making Berghaus were like really top top end company. They were making just you know re- some really really good really really good stuff like top of the range kind of stuff. Um, not so much now. I think I I work I work for Berghaus for a while, and I was I was crap. I was it was terrible. It was really terrible. Um, I was just not. I just, it was just like a company like that. It's just all. It's just all all about politics. It's nothing. Nothing about gear. Like they know they know they can make like really really shit gear and people will still buy it because it's got bag house on it. Um, certain types of people, but they they have no like re- they have really no cachet anymore. And I think I had this idea that I would go and work for them and I'd help them, you know, re- regenerate something. But it was a completely pointless exercise. Um, but I remember like there was they had this big meeting and there was there was like. You basically a company like that. You you have the sales force, who literally could have been selling fitted kitchens the day before. Then you have like the marketing department, who basically could have been marketing fitted kitchens the day before. Where you know where before you had this, you had these people who were running these companies who were like really, really you know interested in you know really obsessive about climbing and mountaineering and expeditions and all that kind of stuff. Now that doesn't really exist anymore. So, but remember there was the marketing department. They were talking about this big thing that they had like two comp- they had two kind of customers, and one was fresh air, and one was cool air. <laughs> so one one was about like you know fresh air out in the outdoors, you know all that kind of stuff, and the other one was like cool air, like hanging with your homies, um, you know in moss side wearing your wearing your bag house jacket, all that kind of stuff. And I was like, so I put my hand up and said, like, what about dog hair? <laughs> Oh God, it's, it's terrible. I sometimes look back at like stuff like that. I'm like, what the? Interest. Interestingly, I actually I ran. Um, I've done quite a few, uh, quite a few kind of events where you get a, a lot of designers together and people like that, and you take them out on the hill and stuff. And it's in, it's interesting how a lot of designers aren't actually um, users. Uh, they're just they're just kind of designers, so they could. They could, you know, they could be, I might have mentioned this, I might have mentioned all these stories before, but, you know, I once worked for a company and the guy, uh, the design manager, I think he'd worked for like Puff Daddy or Puff Diddy or somebody. <laughs> so, you know, like he'd, he, you know, and then he was like working for this, you know, company. So, um, you know, the the, the design, uh, like in this, in this time, like in the 90s, like all those, all those people who were designing this gear were real kind of users. So like Rab was basically designing the gear. Um, you know, all they 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 really were like hands on. Like they would go on a trip and then they would come back and they'd be like, "What we need is you know this kind of thing." So it was a lot of like innovation and a lot of like practical kind of stuff. But it slowly changed the the culture. Kind of changed in 
um, sort of like outdoor brands, um, outdoor companies became outdoor brands, if you know what I mean. And nobody in that chain of the business, the, the owners, the designers, the salespeople, they were they could have been selling anything, designing anything, like running anything. So that's one reason why uh, it kind of is that that you know there are some there are some brands that are making like really kind of niche you know kind of stuff, and it's still very very hands on. Uh, like someone like Pod, like Pod rucksacks don't exist anymore, but like Pod was just one guy making rucksacks who was like super super keen. He wasn't like a mountaineer, but he knew lots of mountaineers like Andy Cave and Rab and all those kind of people. So that kind of fed into the rucksacks he was making. He was making some like fantastic rucksacks, like the um, ice. What's it called? Like ice, black ice rucksacks. They were really really great rucksacks. In, and the same with like wild things in the US and MacPack and you know, but all the, all those companies have, have basically gone. Like Pod disappeared. Um, wild things is owned by some company that's basically focusing on making military gear. MacPack is could just be make it could be any brand. It could be Benetton. Basically, it's not what it not what it used to be. Um, but anyway, so I, I I did one of these uh, co- one after a few of these things where you got designers out, and what was interesting was you would go up on like the Cairngorm Plateau and it'd be like really, really windy and they'd be like walking along in their in their jackets. And then the like chief designer would be like, oh, I've, I never understood why there was a wire in the hood of a jacket and now and now I get it. And it was like, oh my God, like how can, how can you be designing gear that, you know, and be uh, just not really understand what you're, what you're doing. So anyway, but I guess it, I guess it just shows it doesn't really matter really. <laughs> Like, uh, you know, it's a bit like, you know, like a website works because it's working on sort of HTML. Like it look, might look shit and it might look whatever, but it's basically, you know, if, it, if it's kind of functioning, it's, you know, you can't you can't make up your own, um, you know, sort of coding thing to, to produce something on it on on a website. And it's the same with, fab, with, with clothing. As long as it's made out of some breathable waterproof material or some non-breathable waterproof material, uh, and as long as it's made out of some kind of synthetic fiber or what or whatever, you know, it's gonna it's gonna work. Like people used to walk around, you know, wearing just like a blanket, and you know, like you was you didn't need to be a designer to make a blanket. Um, Any, but on the the story about Doug Scott was he so they had this event and there was all these people saying at Plassey Brennan, and uh, one morning uh, a lot of them, like a lot of the 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 kind of B team. Um, so I decided to go up to like the northern Corries, go up to go up to Schnecta, and uh, Doug Doug Scott and and Chris Bonnington were like the A team, like like Chris Bonnington. I remember like Chris Bonnington basically like told me off because I think Vic, I think Chris Bonnington like vouched for me to get a job at Berg House, and I just fucked it up basically. And he, I think he told me that I was I dropped the ball or something. It was, ter- it was really terrible to get like basically told off by Chris Bonington and I did really it's like it's just it's like shameful that people vouch for you and you're just like as you know um and uh so yeah so Chris Bonington I think he was like the he wasn't the director but he was one of the directors of Berg House so he's maybe still is but you know he's like very corporate he, he, he he's behaves himself he doesn't like go off shagging prostitutes and stuff and snorting cocaine which probably like Leah Holding probably does but um that's why Leah Holding probably works for Berg House because they really need someone like Leah to be to kind of give it some sense of you know of what it of what it used to be even if it isn't but Leah Hol- Leah Holding is amazing he can make like shit clothes look amazing like he, that's his that's his apart from being a fantastic climber like you could, you could, you could dress him up in like Matty Land kind of kids' clothes or something, and he would look bloody amazing in them. So, um, actually, on the on the subject of Chris Bonington uh, telling me off, I I, I don't know if it's because I'm fifty. Um, do you know, is, is, that, is it R D Lang? He said something like, "If you go, the best thing about having a mental breakdown is if you get through it, you end up having amazing." Um, wisdom or something and i kind of i i think like in 2014 2014 2015 i had some kind of some kind of mental breakdown kind of thing and um and i like through all my life i always had this idea that i was having like midlife crisis but i, I wasn't having midlife crisis i was just living and that's what that's what 
like actually living your life is going to create crises in your life like decisions and things you have to deal with like if you're not living your life you won't have any of those things you're just like dead basically free <laughs> going around like a zombie um but like in 2014 i did have like a proper like something you know kind of lost 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 the plot uh but i think i actually thinking back to the chris bonington thing and like many many things in my life before that before going mad and sort of coming through it and having some kind of wisdom like the wisdom is the wisdom is basically get fucking growing the fuck up basically and i was although i know I, I was probably some kind of you know like people would see me as being some sort of alpha male kind of person going off climbing doing all this kind of shit i was a i was like a total beta male in a way like i never really made that transition from being a child to an adult and because uh you know i was like married really young and my wife was like you know she's like but like you know lectures you know she's a lectures and academic works in social work or whatever you know she's like you she was like your classic modern woman who is um you know basically wants a beat wants a beat a male basically and it's not it's, like, it's not her fault that's the way that's the way the world is designed these days but it means if you're like a beta male like i'm not one of these insult people not gonna go around shoot, shooting people now but you know like it, it's good to it's good to realize if someone is gonna take on the role of the adult in your relationship that it allows you to be just a fucking loser and just not take responsibility for either anything to, that you're gonna do or anything you have done because it's like well i'm a child you know why should i you know i don't children don't go around with wallets or have a watch or have a credit card or you know, understand what the bills are or anything else so you just kind of disengage from from uh from being an actual adult from being a, a man basically <laughs> so i so again but even but blaming blaming being a beat being a beta male um on on being a fuck up with the Chris Bonington is also not is also a beta male kind of thing in that you just have to take responsibility. Like it was your fault. Like you just you just allowed someone else to dominate you in your life and be you know feckless and all that and all that kind of stuff. So you know if you, if you it's, it's good if you if you, anyone here is young is listening to this, uh, men or women, um, it's a good it's a good thing to like realize is the sooner you the sooner you can you can start thinking yourself as an adult and not as a child like was like every most most people you meet most people my age you know generation x generation blah 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 um they're they 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 all like suffer from the same kind of thing like they're not fully engaging with the opportunity they've been given by being born in the world so and it's too late for me but it's not too late for some people so anyway so they're uh so these the B team on this uh, they they start walking in they start walking into the the northern quarries and the weather's like absolutely terrible absolutely terrible and they're walking in and they get like almost there and they go oh this is fucking ridiculous like we can't go climbing in this this is like terrible and if you get a load of like climbers together you know like sort of good good climbers no one wants to be the one who's like oh this is shit like I want to go I want to go back you know the low the low wanna keep on going so anyway eventually someone's like this is this is bullshit let's just go back let's this is crazy so they all turn around and they all start walking back down the trail in this in this kind of semi white out and then suddenly below them they see the huge hulking frame of doug scott and behind him like chris bonnington kind of like like coming like forcing the way up through this storm towards the northern corridor and like fuck fuck it's like chris bonnington and doug scott like what we're we gonna do like quick hide so they all like ran off the trail and kind of hid behind these rocks and then doug scott and chris bonnington like come past them and then they like feel really shamed like like chris bonnington was probably at the time was probably like 60 something or something and same like doug scott's a bit younger but you know they were like you know they were like old old um senior citizens of um of, of extreme climbing anyway so they'll go past them and like oh god that's terrible so they kind of mop down the thing feeling totally totally shamed anyway but the the what actually happened was chris bonnick and doug scott went about another 200 meters and they're like this is fucking shit let's go let's turn around and go home so they so they did as well so anyway so um so yeah so so that was my first sort of interaction uh um with 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 doug scott 
And I goes, I, I always, I think like when you meet someone like that, when you're young and stuff, you, it's like really is kind of amazing, you know, although as you get older, you meet all these people and you realize that they're just, they're just people. They're just, you know, they're, you know, like it, there is something about it, about meeting people early on. Maybe it's a good thing and that you realize they're human and you could be, you know, as good as them or whatever, yeah, maybe. Um, um, so this, the, the, I think I ended up, so I eventually ended up like, you know, being, you know, this is when I first met him, I was an absolute nobody. And then, you know, life progressed and I started doing more kind of climbing and, and you know, doing harder stuff and ended up sort of having a, a sort of a career uh, going, doing talks about my adventures and stuff. And I was invited to the Fort William, Fort William Film Festival uh, when it first started up in Scotland. And Chris Bonington was, I mean, uh, Doug Scott was, was also talking there. And we ended up like staying in the same hotel and he was staying there with his two kids who he had like young, like a bit, but one interesting about Doug Scott was he had a very, he was like a lot of people. I don't mean, if you've ever, if you've never seen the film, um, Beware of Mr. Baker about Ginger Baker, like that is one of the best documentaries I think anyone's ever made. Absolutely fantastic documentary. Um, basically about someone who is a master in his art but like an absolute fucking fuckwit in everything else like in his life and just like a uh you know this you know someone said like ginger baker as a as a drummer you know he taught me everything as a man he like taught me nothing or something and uh and uh, doug scott was a little bit like that like he had like loads of failed marriages and divorces and kids and all and all and all this kind of stuff so you know kind of a a product of that generation really is a hippie like there's that famous story where someone said um because because doug had like long hair and he used to wear like round glasses and someone said oh you look like uh, john lennon and he said no john lennon looks like me <laughs> so which is probably which could be true because you know chris was like i mean oh god why can't we chris anyway doug was you know kind of getting famous uh in that period of the 60s and so he could have uh you know, there's like Mick Jagger was a rock climber, uh, which is kind of interesting. Before he was famous, he was into rock climbing. So, um, so we yes, yeah, so we ended up at this uh, this thing, and I ended up having. I was a bit, you know, you're always a bit shy, but there was only me and Doug and his kids in this whole hotel. So I ended up going and uh, sort of sitting with Doug. Um, I think we we were there for like two or three days, and we would just uh, have a, we'd have our breakfast together at the same time. And like Doug was like just such an interesting guy. Like he just had so many interesting stories and stuff to do with climbing, stuff to not do with climbing. I remember he told me this story. Do you know Mallory and Irving? Like when they when they maybe climbed Everest, he had this had this story that he'd been told by someone else that that Mallory's wife or Irving's wife, like when they died on Everest, that his wife was staying over with somebody. And when she came down in the morning, she said, like, I just had, I had, like, in the night, like, Mallory, like, came to me in a, you know, like, as his ghost came to me and he was telling me all the things he wanted me to do with the children and all the, you know, and the, where the, where the documents were and his will and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, and, every, and it was like, he was totally in the room with me. And he said, in fact, I'm going to go back to bed now. I'm so tired. So she's walking away. And then someone said, "Did he do it?" And she said, "Of course he did." Anyway, so that little little stories like that, you're telling stories like that, and just just stories about you know people and climbers and stuff. And like Doug's actual like le- lecturing ability, like he was basically fucked. Like his hip was fucked from probably from the ogre, and he walked like his leg was basically bent. Like he just walked like a, he was basically like a cripple. He kind of could hardly walk anywhere and you could just see he was like really really beaten up really and beaten up by life as well probably beaten up by his marriages and things like that he was basically i think he i got the impression he was basically homeless and penniless or something he was he wasn't he wasn't he'd not come out well from his from his like relationships and all the money he must have made in the past from doing stuff um but yeah his his like lecturing style he would just like get up on this like stool and he would start 
telling these stories about Everest, but it was it was kind of it was good if you'd never heard them and it was good if you're really into Himalayan climbing. But it wasn't really he wasn't really a performer. You know, he's like, oh, yeah, this is a, this is, you know, North Face of Ch- Chakmandu. Oh, yeah, we'd climb this with some so and then uh, so and so died or something. And then he'd be like, this is the th-. it was a bit like that. And someone told me they once went to a slideshow where there was loads of drunk people there, like loads of drunk students. And they all started, they just started getting the giggles when he, every time he said someone died, everyone would start, start giggling. And then it got worse and worse. And then the duck was kind of, you know, he was, he didn't, he didn't, he just didn't notice. And he, he told me he did a, a lecture somewhere and he went on so long that eventually they just switched off the slide projector and he was just like, oh, I guess, I guess that's it. I guess that's the end. And he just walked off the stage. So, um, one of the funniest stories he did the Paul Nunn Memorial Lecture in Sheffield, and I, uh, I don't know if they still do the Paul Nunn Memorial Lecture. But it was quite good. I once did it with it was me and Joe Simpson did like a lecture, and he was doing this lecture, and he was going on and on and on and on and on, and everyone was just like, "Oh Christ! Like when's this? When's this going to end?" And he started. Um, he started, and he got into like the, the topic of the seven summits, and he's going the number seven. It's an interesting number, the number seven. The seventh sign, seven, <laughs> seven brides, seven brides. You know what's up? What's up? You know, just like going about number seven, and then someone just shouted from the from the audience, seven minutes till closing time, and then everyone burst out laughing, and then they all just started getting up and just like leaving the leaving the venue, and again Doug was like, oh, I guess I guess that's it. So, but like sometimes he could be really good. He, he was, I don't know, he just, he just told the same stories like a billion times. And, uh, you know, it was it just, it just you know, yeah, seven brides for seven brothers. Um, it, one, one funny story someone told me about Doug was they, D- Doug got, uh, won the Empire Medal because he was the first British, you know, him and um, Dougal Haston. Well, he was the first Englishman, I guess. He was the first Englishman, I think, to climb Everest. Because Mal, uh, thingy was um, was New Zealander, um, so you know Southwest face of Everest, like amazing, amazing thing. So I think he got he got the Empire Medal, which is like a gold medal, which is you know like really, really a, you know it's it's like getting like it's, it's much it's a much a bigger thing than getting like an OBE or or something. I don't know if he was ever, was he ever Sir Sir Doug Scott? I'm not sure. But anyway, so so Doug got this Empire Medal, got solid gold. You know, this is the, it is like amazing, like winning a, the um, what's the cross? The um, you know, just amazingly thing. Anyway, so one day someone was at his house, and um, the kids were like playing around, you know, going crazy, like in his in his house, and the toys were everywhere. And uh, he looked into this into the toy box where all the kids' toys were. In the bottom of the toy box was the Empire Medal, which I thought was that is like a really Chris Bonita kind of thing. I think eventually one of his wives uh, took the medal and melted it down, and to get the gold because uh, for the for the money, which is a which is a, a sort of sad story. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, like Doug, uh, so as le- later on, like in life, like I had more, I had quite a lot of dealings with Doug, and Doug would. Because because it was Doug Scott, like if he asked you to do something, you would always basically do it because it was like Doug Scott. So he had this charity, Can, which was uh, what did it stand for? Can mm, I don't know what it stood for. Um, anyway, Asian Network something charity. Asia. Anyway, so he was like building schools and hospitals in Himalayas in Nepal. So you know he would ask you to do a talk for him, and I did like a I did what I did a tour, and it was me me. Um, me Simon, uh, not Simon Kennedy. Me, um, uh, uh, Alex Huber. Um, oh, what's his name? Um, Thingy Kennedy, who um, who who used who started Climbing Magazine. Michael Kennedy. Uh, like Michael Kennedy, he was very dry. He was very American. He was very like, you know, he wasn't very emotional. He wasn't very. He wasn't a performer on stage. And I once was a, I once did a talk in uh, Boulder, Colorado for Alpinist magazine. I think it was, I probably told this story, but there was Michael Kennedy, then it was me, then it was Jimmy Chin. This was before Jimmy Chin, everyone, anyone really knew Jimmy Chin was. 
And uh, anyway, Michael Kennedy came up and he did this talk and everyone was talking and it was like really, really, they couldn't hear what he was saying. And it was like, re- he was probably talking about something amazing, but it, and no one could really hear what he was talking about. It just wasn't engaging with the audience. Then I got up and I was like, shut the fuck up, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I was like, everyone started listening to what I was saying. So so it was like, I, it went down really well, my talk. And anyways, that, then Jimmy Jin came on and he just played some reggae music. He didn't, didn't, didn't say anything. And then, um, yeah, then I was like, I was like talking to someone at the bar, you know, and I was like, uh, I said, uh, he, he was saying, what did you, what do you think? What do you think to the, to the, to the night? I said, oh God, Michael Kennedy. Like, you know, he was a bit shit, wasn't he? And he was like, oh, I'm, I'm Michael Kennedy. But he just said it, he just said it was just a really crestfallen, like, oh, that was me. So, um, anyway, so we did, I did a tour with Doug Scott and, uh, and it was funny because, because that, uh, it was Alex Huber. Yeah, Alex is like very uh, Germanic, and he's very. He comes across as quite serious. Is uh, you know, it's from the. Is it not from the Tyrol? Is um, is the uh, I can't remember. Is you know, it's like it's very um, you know, it's very Germanic basically. And I remember like because mine was kind of funny. My my slideshow and to begin with it was like I was the second person, and then eventually they put me on as the main person because. Because it because it was it was really funny my my talk and then Alex would come on it would be a bit, it wouldn't be as funny and it would just create a weird imbalance to the evening really so I was there just at entertainment value not for, nothing to do with how good you are which is probably probably not easy for Alex because Alex was like Alex like a superhero so uh, it's a bit like a Batman and Robin and say can Robin go on after Batman <laughs> so I remember Alex was like yes I'm very funny in German so in Germany um, so yes yeah, so, so he would. Doug would ask you to do all these things, and you would never be able to, re- never be, able, never be able to refuse. And but generally, like most of the time, they were absolutely a disaster. Like no one would turn up, or it would just, you know. I'd, I remember I missed like my daughter's like sixteenth birthday because I'd agreed to do this talk for Doug Scott in in uh, London. It was just a dis- it was just a disaster, and uh, yeah, it was. It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't good. But then he'd ask you again. You'd you'd go and do it again. And you know, I I just you'd bend over backwards to help him, and because it was like for a good cause, and it was for and it was for Doug. And Doug was always really, he just such. A, it was kind of just cool to be able to hang out with Doug, even if it was only you and Doug, and nobody and nobody else was there. Probably one of the best stories to, to sort of sum up how how Doug was really was um, at one time he asked someone. If he would go, if he would give him to a lift to the airport, so he was like Doug was living in the Lake District, and he had his friend who would like help help him do stuff. So the guy like turns up, and he, you know, they get into the, the fills up the car, and they start start driving down to Manchester Airport, which is you know like an hour and a half away, two hours. They're, they're driving down the motorway, you know, two hours later, the he, he start he's coming towards the airport, the the, the turn off of the airport, Manchester Airport, it's there, Manchester Airport. The guy starts signalling, and and Doug's like, "No, Heathrow," <laughs> which if you don't know, Heathrow is like another like three hours away or something. It's like a five hour, ten hour round trip to take him to Heathrow Airport. So, you know, but again, you could never really hold it against Doug because he was, it was just, he was just the way he was. Really, I'm sure it'd be the same if you had, you know, you know, like Bob Dylan in your car or something. You know, like you just, it was just, it would have been like like five hours with Doug in the car would be wouldn't be uh wouldn't be a chore but the five hours coming home again without me in your car would be would be a bit of a ball lick. um i think the last i think in in some in some ways like doug um i think doug kind of he actually was he actually kind of became maybe a little bit gentrified in his in his later later life uh like he could play that he could play that game of being a a gent in a way like he would you know, like he was a very sort of, sort of scruffy kind of rugby shirt kind of guy. But then towards later in his life, he definitely had a phase. Maybe, maybe he sort of um, got his shit together, like in his in his real life. And like he got, I don't, I don't know if he got remarried, but he definitely was with his partner who was very stable. And he he got into gardening. I think the last thing ever he ever told me that he just had like two tons of soil delivered to his house or something. And I was like, oh god, that's it, game over now. You'd be getting to fucking bed watching and you know, like watercolours next. And uh but he but he definitely um towards the end of his life, he definitely had a period where he was more stable and more happy 
and I guess that is a you know that's kind of nice to see like people don't you know want you know want people like Doug Scott to die with a with their plastic boots on but in a way I I, I kind of got a sense that that he he in a way was found some kind of inner inner peace like he was a very kind of zen buddhist kind of guy uh like a northern you know from nottingham kind of version but he was he was uh he definitely seemed to um you know get some kind of uh get some side of like peace and stability and the last i think it was the last talk i ever did for him it was at the royal geographical society in london and afterwards, like me being a, a beta male, like I had no, I had no, I just turned up and didn't know I have anywhere to stay or whatever. Of after it, I just kind of think I was just going to just wing it or whatever. So we, you know, we kind of come out and Doug's like, we went for this meal, and then Doug's like, "Where are you staying?" I'm like, "Oh, I don't really, I don't really have anywhere to stay." And he said, "Oh, you can stay at my club." <laughs> like who would think that that the Doug Scott would say you can stay at my club? So we ended up getting this taxi. We ended up going to the Sloan Club, which is, you know, like, I don't know if it's still, maybe it's still there, but, you know, private members club. You know, never, like, the idea of me being a private me- private members club. And, uh, you know, we went in there and uh, he got me in this room. And then in the morning, you know, you go down, everyone's having the breakfast. And it was like, it was like the, uh, in this breakfast area, it was like the after party from some party, the Great Gatsby um, would have thrown but uh, with all the guests being like a hundred years old and everyone was just decrepit and people be going for I think Doug probably had like a, sh- a shirt and tie and a jacket on you know for his for his breakfast and I just had a t-shirt on I made the massive faux pas of having a mobile phone as well that's like you're not allowed to have mobile phones uh, in the Sloan club so I think that was kind of the my last uh, my last dealings with him and the last sort of anecdote I had was someone told me they could like Doug was a man of his age basically like he he created a lot of problems like he didn't like he didn't like bolting he didn't want Brit, like British uh, mountaineering to be involved British mountain BMC to be involved in like competitive climbing Olympic climbing and he was a real um, he created like a lot of like people just want everything to be nice and smooth and everyone to agree and everything but Doug was. Doug was like a stone in everyone's plans, basically. And you know, you had like before you Doug, you had like Ken Wilson. You had these people who really, you know, were like a sand in the cogs, basically. You know, of of progress. But that's really what you need in climbing. I think these days you don't have it anymore. People are like, ah, oh, do what you want. I don't really care. You know, I'm just going to bolt up the whole of Stanage. Ah, oh, I don't really care. Don't good don't climb there anymore. Um. And anyway, so this is this is kind of a funny story because this pr- probably shows why, you know, Doug was probably on borrowed time in this modern modern world of cancel culture, in that someone rang him up and it was the headmistress of some famous girls private girls school in London, and they said, um, oh, uh, oh, Mr. Scott, we'd love you to come and do a, you know, like a slideshow for us, and uh, you know, we'll give you like, you know, lots of money for your uh, for your charity and stuff, and he was like. Oh, that, oh, that'd be great. That'd be great. Oh, great, great stuff. And they were like, um, "Would you be able to? Uh, would you be able to send us an email? You know, with all your, uh, you know, all your details and stuff." He's like, "Oh, no, no, I don't send the, I don't, I don't write emails. That's that's woman's work." And the person just put the phone straight down on him. So um, that was kind of that was that's kind of the, the that's took Scott really. Um, but I just thought I'd read you in my book. Um, in my book. Uh, down book the last uh there's like a little epilogue an epilogue anyway it's like a last word and i'll just read you this because it kind of uh uh it's to do with like you know meeting doug scott like all those years ago i come down the stairs for breakfast it's winter so the small hotel is all but empty the dining room is almost silent the only sound the gurgle of melting snow escaping the roof down the drain pipe and the clicking cutlery of a single diner the hotel's only guest, God himself. He greets me with, Morning, youth, as I pull up the chair and sit beside him, a little intimidated to be alone with such a man as this. He asks me if I want some of his tea, lifts up the hot metal pot with a large butcher's hand and begins to pour before I reply. As the tea pours, I look at his thinning white hair, grey stubble, his imperfect imperfections, notice how battered his body is, Think how I've seen him walking on the stage 
in the film festival last night, barely able to hobble on his one good knee. And yet, sat opposite him now, you could still see the body of a rugby player, a fighter, someone with the physical capacity to scale a southwest face of Everest, Changabang, Nanga Parbat, and all the others, and the physical and mental capacity to come back. I order my breakfast, meat to his veggie, and we talk about food for a while, not mountains. Then I tell him about an idea for a book I want to write, a book about descent, a book that would eventually take me 20 years to write. He begins to share a story of climbing Shishkapangma with Alex and Roger, now long dead, how they were going alpine style, how they were really pushing it, strung out and exposed. It tells me now, when they reached the summit, he felt he had very little left in the tank, yet they were only halfway, and now only and now had to down climb the route, steep and deadly. As I was down climbing, I went into a dream state. I imagined my mother at home, looking at my kids, sat in the living room, telling them, don't worry, your dad is being so careful. He's taking care with every single step he takes. That image, those words, was all I could think about. And that's what I did. I focused on every single step, all the way down. It's a great privilege to take tea with God, to heed his words, and so grow old and tell such stories. Thank you very much. That's uh, that's that's it for this week's uh, podcast. Um, any more news? Any any? Uh... Yeah, I'm on tour soon, so check that out on my website. Um, the speakers from the edge. Look on speakers from the edge. And uh, Pete Whitaker is always is also going to be on tour soon. Uh, he's going to finish up his the tour he was doing before the deadly C word appeared. And uh, I'm going to try and I'm going to try and get Pete Whitaker on the podcast to talk about. Pete Whitaker kind of stuff so until then I'll see you soon Underdog Fantasy is the fastest growing fantasy app and easiest place to play fantasy sports. Just jump on underdogfantasy.com or download the app, draft your team, and that's it. And if drafts aren't your thing, they also have a pick'em game where you can win 20 times your money in a single night. Use promo code RADIO and Underdog will double your first deposit when you sign up with up to $100 in bonus cash. Deposit $100? Get $100 free. That's promo code RADIO. Terms and conditions apply. What's that place you've always wanted to try? Well, you're there. Sharing plates with... Just one bite. Or on second thought, maybe not sharing. It's that good. When you're with Amex, it's not if it's going to happen, but when. American Express. Don't live life without it.